Nick, 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 From Nickelodeon Animation in Burbank, California, this is the Nickelodeon Animation Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Hector Navarro, and we have got a hilarious episode for you today. Our guest is a storyboard artist, character designer, producer, actor, director, creator of a show that you grew up loving, most likely, called The Angry Beavers. And if you've ever wondered how The Angry Beavers was so funny, so witty, so sharp, so sarcastic, so stylish, then you need to look no further than its creator, Mr. Mitchell Shower. Mitch, thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you for in. having me. Yeah, <laughs> the Angry Beavers, cool show. Uh, you've done other cool stuff in cartoons. Great, thanks. Okay, I'm off to Cartoon Network. Yeah. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so, what kind of stuff did you love as a kid? And at what point did you think I can maybe someday work in cartoons? How did that all come about? Well, I started drawing when I was 18 months old. My mother saved the drawing, uh, and I have one framed on my wall. When I drew, uh, drew when I was two, called uh, it was a train called. Toot toot. It wasn't until I got into fifth grade when somebody laughed at one of my drawings that was supposed to be funny. Okay. I did okay. a lot of funny drawings okay, that great. weren't supposed to be funny. <laughs> so uh, I thought, you know what? Maybe drawing is something. But I really wanted to be a comic book artist. Yeah. Which I actually finally got to do. But, yeah. Uh, along the way, I, I got in, interested in animation and I'd get up on Saturday morning and sit in front of the test pattern until seven o'clock mm-hmm. and then all the classic Warner Brothers things were on and. Uh, a lot of stuff that doesn't exist anymore. People don't even remember it anymore. Black and white stuff. There was one that was hosted by a sailor, live action. <laughs> okay. But he was chroma keyed in. Wow. Uh, and then he would show cartoons in there. We had a show called uh, Big Bill and Umagog, which was a live action show, and he would show cartoons. But Umagog was a cardboard box robot. <laughs> and th- this is all local. This is growing up in Tulsa. Just, uh, you know, Felix the Cat and all those black and white cartoons. Mm-hmm. Popeyes. I love the Popeyes. And uh, then I was a huge fan of uh, when Hanna-Barbera got into action adventures. So Johnny Quest, Herculoids, Space Ghost. Yeah. I wasn't much of a fan of their funny stuff. But the Hanna-Barbera <coughs> action heroes yeah. were fantastic, yeah. And Banana Splits had some nice animation in that. So anyway, as I was doing that, and I was still, uh, I started reading comics when I was like 12. Mm-hmm. Uh, before then, my dad would not let me read comics. <laughs> he says, read a book. You know, read something important. Don't read those. So I snuck out and bought comics and brought them home. And I and it was actually what I was doing is I was drawing, copying drawings out of them. And he he walked in and he goes, "What are you doing down there?" I said, "Well, I'm I'm copying these drawings in the from the comic books." Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so from then on, I could have comics. I had the Preston Blair animation book, and I was always copying the animated drawings out of there. Mm-hmm. So I kind of was doing something in tandem I with animation it. and comics, and then. Um, when I graduated high school, I sent a letter to Disney Studios saying I'd like to, in a portfolio, I think, mm-hmm. that I wanted to uh, get a job Yeah. after I graduated. <laughs> so they sent a letter back saying you should go to CalArts. So I did. <laughs> just that CalArts. simple. <laughs> yeah. It just, I just walked out here from Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> the animation was kind of in a bad way. Yeah. They, they, I think the only thing they were doing was the Black Cauldron. Yeah. TV was kind of whatever. At Disney, yeah, that was a that was an interesting era for sure. Yeah, yeah. so I mm-hmm. thought, you know what? Maybe animation, I should think of something else that, you know, I can feed myself with. Yeah. So I went over to Art Center and got my degree in av- advertising and illustration. Fantastic. And, and I did go into advertising for a while. What kind of stuff did you do in advertising? Uh, mostly art direction. Uh, I directed commercials, live action commercials for oh, banks. Great. I wrote music jingles for... Uh, a bank and a tobacco company back then. And then uh, I was freelancing out here. But I was making so much more money freelancing for California or L.A. <laughs> than I was at that job. Yeah, My wife and I just like, well, we probably should go back. Sure. So, so we, we left the state for a couple of years and then we came back. Yeah. And that's when I got involved with Hanna-Barbera and Frizz Freeling and all those guys. Wow. Is that what brought you back? Was it Hanna-Barbera? <clears throat> yeah, because they had that strike yeah. in 81. So uh, not long after that... They offered, you know, if you want to come back, we have something for you. Wow. So I worked on uh, Pink Panther and Sons with uh, Frizz. But before we went back to live in Oklahoma for a couple of years, my first job, I was going to Art Center, mm-hmm. and uh, some girl walked up to me in the summer semester and said, Free, uh, Filmation's looking for people. So I went over and interviewed with uh, 
Herb Hazleton over at Filmation at that time. Mm-hmm. They were looking for a layout artist. He goes, "Hey kid, do you know what a bike pan is? Do you know what a, you know? Do you know what the uh, field guides are? You know?" And I'm <laughs> like, "Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you have any of that stuff? Oh, yep, sure." So I went down in the lobby. We took a break because I had to do a test. Mm-hmm. We went down in the lobby, and my wife was sitting there. She was going to be my wife the next month. She's my fiance. Let's just call her that. Okay, great. <laughs> and uh, I said, "Go down to those ladies who are painting." And ask him what field guides are and a bike pan is. <laughs> so I went back and did the test and came down and my wife had all this stuff. Here you go. Yeah. Ah, okay. So that's that was my first job at Filmation. In my research, I found out you worked on Johnny Quest comics. Was that before or later? Or at what point did you did you kind of work in comic books a little bit? Well, I think that was, uh, seems like that was around 1990. I was working at Hanna-Barbera and had been, been working at Film Roman with... Uh, uh, Mark Evanier, mm-hmm. who's a terrific writer, both for television and comics. <clears throat> and we struck up a friendship, and one time he came to me and said, you know, Will Minio is going to drop out of the DNA agents for Eclipse. Would you like to draw it? So um, I did it for a little over a year. But I just found that producing all day yeah. at the studio and then going home at night and having a big white piece of paper in front of me, <sighs> I, I could do it for about a year. <laughs> and then I'm and then like, okay. I've done I comics. Did, I did it. I did Bucket comics. list is done. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was fun. And Great. Mark was easy to work with. He's a terrific writer. Made it very easy for me. Very cool. So I got to do my comics. Yeah. And I will tell you a bit of trivia. Okay. I applied for a job as a comic book artist at Marvel. Mm-hmm. This is right after high school. And I did this full page drawing of Iron Man. And I remember the pose. And damn if Johnny Romita Jr. didn't steal that thing. <laughs> because that is my drawing. <laughs> In the 80s at Hanna-Barbera, I mean, you did Super Friends, The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo was one of my favorites with Vincent Price, the legendary Vincent yes, Price. That Vincent. was Vincent. <laughs> yes. uh, you worked on My Little Pony, The Smurfs, Fantastic Max in the late 80s, Garfield and Friends, and we're going into the 90s, Bobby's World, Tom and Jerry the Movie, uh, The Addams Family, Freakazoid. What was it like in those days working on animation in the various sort of jobs that you were doing? Because you were going from storyboard artist to design supervisor to producer. And what was that point in your career like? Well, it's it's pretty much like you young guys do today. You all network yeah. with each other. Well, we had a network back then, too. Yeah. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they've all died. <laughs> so I have no network now. I'm just one guy. like Kind of like PBS. <laughs> uh, but uh, I would go to work at Hanna-Barbera and... Uh, I'd work through a season, and Bill Hanna would come around at the end of the season for the layoff, and he would he would come around individual people, and he came up to me and goes, uh, Mitch, we'd like to have you come back in two weeks because we really, really liked your work. Yeah. Okay. And two weeks later, I was back. I mean, he, he stuck to his word. But because of Hanna-Barbera, then you would, you would get uh, the Patty Freeling who knew you who you were, mm-hmm. and all these other studios knew who you were. So they like, when are you going to wrap up on that? September. Could you come over and do this? So that's why you see those names on there. It's just yeah. kind of like you were just <laughs> leapfrogging to all these different jobs. At Hanna-Barbera, I was a associate producer on Son of the Pink Panther mm-hmm. and got to work with the great Frizz Freeling. So when that wrapped up, Gene McCurdy, who was a head of uh, kind of the creative side mm-hmm. of the studio, mm-hmm. and she calls me in. I met her. I talked to her a couple of times. She goes, you want to produce Scooby-Doo? I'm like, okay. Do you think I can? I wouldn't ask if you couldn't. <laughs> so that's how I got 13 Goes of Scooby Doo. I have a question about Bobby's world. Is it true that you designed Little Bobby based off of your son yes. at the time? Is that right? Uh, Robert was four at the time. And he's a gigantic kid now. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's, he's big. <laughs> An adult, I would And think, he's yeah. wonderful. I, I, yeah. you know, he's a wonderful kid. Very, <laughs> very, very kind and, That's cool. and caring. But at that time, he's kind of like a puppy. His head was getting bigger and bigger, and his body was trying to keep up with it. And yeah. So uh, there he was, sitting there with his hair all jagged and stuff, and this kind of big head with his little body. So I was sitting in a meeting with everybody. I think even Margaret Lesh was in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just did this sketch. Uh, does Bobby look like this? Yeah. That's it. 
So that's, that's simple. That's, that's how it. we did it. That's great. So now I want to ask about where in uh, uh, you're you're producing different cartoons and you're going from show to show, and then you won an Emmy for producing on Freakazoid. Correct. Which is fantastic. What was it? I mean, Freakazoid was an awesome show. People love that show it's still to this day. What was it like working on that show? Well, it was it was a tricky environment, and Warner Brothers at that time because mm-hmm. they were doing Animaniacs and everything they were doing was a hit show. I'd been working in a company. We'd done a pilot for the Beavers, mm-hmm. but the pilot got put on the shelf because they wanted to do Hey Arnold, mm. which is fine. Okay. So I went over to Warner Brothers because uh, of Gene McCurdy mm-hmm. and uh, Bill Dubay, who was the art director at the time. He came up with this huge stack of stuff, and he, it was, this is like April. It's Freakazoid. Yeah. Uh, they want the show on the air by September. So we had seven crews, uh-huh. seven full crews, and all of them were good. Everybody on those crews were good. And we had a studio overseas that was terrific. And we had Paul Rudd and uh, the writers, uh, Paul Rugg, and the writers uh, with uh, Tom Ruger. They were writing terrific scripts. And the show hit the air on September, but uh, right around September is when I got the call, we're going to pick up Beavers. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went to Gina and said, I got to go. I, yeah. It's my show. I it's go. your show. But uh, Freakazoid was a pleasure because uh, it was just money flowed like wine. <laughs> <laughs> When did you know, when did you come up with the Angry Beavers? This is my show. This is my idea. I was working at a company called Gunther Wall, and Lee Gunther came to me one day, and he goes, "Uh, we have a window to pitch to Nickelodeon. Could you come up with three shows? And I did. So uh, Beavers was one of them. Another one was a a house that's alive. (laughs) I can't remember the third one. So anyway, I did these drawings of these beavers, and I I remember sitting down to draw the beavers, and uh, it was just kind of like spontaneous shapes uh, I'll just give him this kind of nose and stuff and then that became the joke in the show like you know, <laughs> we're beavers um, so that went over to Nickelodeon mm-hmm. I didn't go to the pitch really no it was pitched for me I guess Mary Harrington saw this animation cells we did like three animation cells or two or whatever she was really intrigued with this one we started developing that and then uh, I had a meeting with Mary and Jerry Laburn Jerry was just getting ready to leave Nickelodeon but uh, I think after they picked up the show we did a pilot, but when they picked up the show, I had this meeting with Mary and uh, Jerry Laybourne, and uh, Jerry Laybourne made me feel like I was the most important <laughs> person in the world. I, I have never been interviewed or talked to someone like that where you walk out like, oh, my God, she she just loves me. Yeah. And, <laughs> cause she was so, Well, I found out she was a school teacher at one time. Oh. So she was talking to me like a two-year-old. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't like her. You know? But uh, anyway, it was uh, it was just kind of a— it was a thing with beavers. Uh, at that time, there were Care Bears and Strawberry Shortcake. Yeah. And I said, I want something angry. <laughs> so I said, okay, something angry. Uh, and uh, what's not angry? So I went down a list of animal beavers are harmless. Yeah. So I just thought angry beavers is juxtaposed to Care Bears would be good. <laughs> so that's how that came about. At what point when you were working on did you know, oh, hey, people really like this? Uh, when I got feedback on the second episode where they stay up all night. Because uh, one of the things that's in there is when those guys are so tired and they start laughing. Yep. Well, Richard and Nick uh, really started laughing. <laughs> and I was, because uh, I was directing the recording, so I would just kind of like let these guys go. Mm-hmm. And we have a script. We'd have a recording script. And then if these guys went off on a tangent, my rule to them is like, just come back. Yeah. Go and then come back. <laughs> so they started laughing. And, and to me, the response to all that laughter uh, was the beginning of it. And then the next one was where their teeth were growing so long, uh, long on the teeth. All along that, we would get uh, responses from more adults. Yeah. Because they'd recognize the... Uh, I was working with Charlie Brissett on the music, and he and I would sit down and spot. And he at the end of the show, he goes, Mitch, you know, because of you, I have like 300 new CDs in my collection. <laughs> because we'd sit down like, I'd like to have Henry Mancini's Baby Elephant Walk here. Yeah. So he'd, have, he'd paraphrase it somehow. Yeah. But I'd always go through and I'd hear certain kinds of music and let's do, uh, let's do Universal Classic Creature from the Black Lagoon or Andy Williams uh, wow. songs or Piri Como or something. And uh, so to me, the adults started responding to it. Mm-hmm. So to me, if the, or the adults were responding to it, that means the kids liked it. Yeah. Because kids will look up to siblings and parents. Oh, you like that? Then it's good. <gasps> 
And it's only 10.34. Yeah, it's only 10.34. <laughs> I can't believe it. We've come too far to give up now. Got to stay up. Oh, night. Talk a little bit about the writers. What was it like working with that crew? Well, Keith Kacharik was a story editor. And Keith was a master of making sure the story had a beginning, middle, and end. And it worked, He was really right. good at that. And he right. could recognize humor really well. Mm -hmm. But then when you have people like uh, Vic Wilson and John Dervlaney and uh, John and uh, the guys that went off a right uh, wrote uh, Cat and Dog or Cat versus Dog, the movie. Yeah. I can't remember their names. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> we had those guys writing. Uh, the idea was... Um, they didn't sit down to write a cartoon like, oh, we, we need to have them go to the store or go to the circus. Right. They would sit down and come up with a situation and uh, go from there. Uh, so they it wasn't that they were making fun of animation. It's just that they felt that, why do we have to do it traditionally? Exactly. So the writing really was crisp with these guys. Absolutely. And we had so much fun with them. And, of course, then you get the actors in there ad-libbing on top of good writing. we got to talk about the actors for a second. we got to talk about Richard Horvitz and Nick Bacay. Because they were next level. You said you were directing their sessions. Yes. How did they um, sort of get involved with the project? Well, we did. Uh, we started uh, interviews uh, when I was still at Gunther Wall. Mm. <clears throat> but Richard was like the second interview for, mm -hmm. for Daggett. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have like people like Kevin Meany. We had some other people try out, but Richard was Daggett. Yeah. But we tried 300 other people to find Norbert, as the joke goes. Nick was the last one. <laughs> but... Uh, he was just coming off ESPN doing something. Wow. And I I'd, I'd heard him or had seen him also uh, on Comedy Central as Alan Havy's sidekick. And I really liked his sense of humor. It was kind of dry, but it was very funny. Yeah. So uh, the fun thing about it was is that they got a, you know, we had uh, Nick in a different, we had him in a booth mm -hmm. so they could overlap. Mm -hmm. And um, Nick and Richard would talk to each other like they really talked to each other. And then Nick added that little bit, like, always kind of uh, putting Richard on or, or teasing Richard a little bit, and he would do that. And Richard would just go with it because he's a great sport, a dear friend. Yeah. So um, these guys would get into this uh, ad-libbing thing, and then Richard would come in and like, uh, I think I'm going to do Bob Hope. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll do Bob Hope, you know. Hey, how about that one? And so he'd do Bob Hope, and then uh, and then he went into something else, uh, doing somebody else's voice, and then we wound up on Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. He was doing Jack Lemmon. Put me on the board. And um, so he would do those things. Yeah. And Nick would just kind of, you know, draw him in and out. Yeah. Draw him in and out. Yeah, absolutely. Really. And, the, and, of course, the overlaps, that's my uh, kind of my admiration for Howard Hawks, mm -hmm. the film director. He was big on overlapping. Mm-hmm. And I thought, this is how people talk. Ask for tacos? No fair, Norman! What? You play gun with me, you dumb guy! <laughs> like you didn't do it. <laughs> like I did. Like I believe you. Like I care. Like I, 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 I like, I, like, 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 good night. like, like, uh, More. am not. Is it true that you became a beaver expert, or were you always a beaver expert before you did the Angry Beavers? I became one. You became one. And you know, you, and the, the big thing was, is, and I was really surprised to learn this, what is the, the beaver's uh, biggest threat? Oh my gosh. Flooding? No. Nope. Flooding? What is it? Falling trees. Oh, <laughs> that's kind of comical. That's sad, but that's also kind of like, yeah. that's kind of a cartoon world threat that's really that's yeah i, I just think if you can laugh at death you, yeah. <laughs> you can know. laugh at anything you yeah. Can, yeah so uh anyway i started studying up on it and that's how we learned that uh when you know beavers have a uh, have babies mm -hmm. and then they have a second litter the first litter leaves so that, that that's was the, the whole pilot. premise that's yeah. The, yeah that's the first episode so that's, that's the whole premise yeah that's hilarious and the, and the tails with the slapping and the and the uh, uh the uh scent yeah uh, the, the yeah. whole scent thing so uh as we went along, we just studied more and more about beavers and tried to incorporate as much as we could. I guess I'm more of a beaver expert than I thought because I watched the Angry Beavers. I had no idea you guys were educating us as well as kids growing up watching oh, yeah. that show. Yeah, because all kids are like beavers. Yeah, <laughs> that they, uh, you know, like long in the teeth. I, I didn't know the beavers' teeth grow up. Also, oh, wow, that's why they eat. That's why they chew because if they don't, their, their teeth actually grow through their brains and kill them. Which I think is funny. <laughs> it's really funny but, in a morbid way. That's so great. I guess if you're upside down, it'd be yeah. funny. So anyway, that's how that story came about. Did you give a signed 
log, an actual log that was bitten by a beaver, <coughs> signed it, and then gave it to executive producer Mary Harrington. Did that actually happen? Yeah, but I, I bit the log. Oh, okay. It wasn't a beaver. You just took no, a piece I'm of not, wood. And... I'm not going near a beaver. <laughs> <laughs> You've talked about what a great experience it was to work on Angry Beavers, but just like any show, I'm sure you guys got notes. And then I found this out, but the character of Kid Friendly, was that in response to some of the sort of broadcast standard notes that you guys would receive? Is that what yeah. that was? Yeah. yeah. You're good. Yeah. You're good. <laughs> we always had notes. Keep it kid friendly. Yeah. So we need a character called kid friendly. The funny thing about the notes, and a couple of times this happened, we had a, an episode that took place in a football stadium. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and they had some concern about, uh, I think, a blimp crashing into the, into the audience and yet, uh, we had two Zarbonis go on, uh, go crazy and actually wipe out the whole crowd. So they were worried about the balloon, but we killed uh, hundreds of people <laughs> with these machines up in the, in the audience. And then we had a show where, like, Norbert was chasing Dagger with an axe. They said, could you make it larger and more colorful so it's not so threatening? <laughs> like, I'll make it as big as you want. Because <laughs> the bigger the axe, the harder they fall, right? <laughs> so uh, we get notes like that. But by and large, they were really open to having us you know see the vision of what we wanted to do yeah so did you, did really you feel like you could really make the show your own yeah yeah and mary always said that too uh, miss harrington yeah she goes mitch it's your show I and mean, it's your vision you got to go for it yeah. so uh we always felt like we it's better to go out there and try something and pull back a little bit so you still get it yeah than trying to be because i was used to being timid with the other networks when i was producing abc sure. and cbs so you got to this thing where you're like i'm afraid to do this yeah not here did you feel like it was a title thing that was different, or was that sort of a Nickelodeon-specific environment thing? It was Nickelodeon. That's great. The, the, the environment back then was, uh, maybe it still is. I don't know. Are you guys happy? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. A lot of thumbs up from the— <laughs> Why I buy that? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but back then, uh, it was like that, and, and uh, it was like this big open family kind of environment. And, uh, you know, every show was different. Every mm-hmm. series was going on was different. Um, so Craig Bartlett and me and— and uh, Joe, who did uh, Cat Dog and all that. Mm-hmm. We all had our little worlds that we were working in, which is fine. We all got along. Everybody got along. And uh, everybody supported each other. <clears throat> and we did the uh, uh, European premiere of Beavers in uh, Cannes. Oh, wow. So we were all over there. And Albie Hecht at the time was the head of the studio. Uh-huh. Uh, so we're sitting around the table and uh, having dinner after the ceremony thing. And Albie's like, hey, Mitch. He's from New York. <laughs> hey, Mitch. You and Cindy ever been to Paris? No, we haven't yet. He gets on the phone like, you're going tomorrow. Make sure you pack your bag. You're going to be in. So they put us up at the Ritz-Carlton and, and Cindy and I are going around like, we. I felt like the Beverly Hillbillies in, wow. in France, you know. <laughs> oh, what are you looking at? I met a cow. She sure is swell. And oh, so fine. I know she's mine. Because she said, yes, she said, I think I like you. What has it been like to see the feedback to the fan base, to the Angry Beavers, as the years go by and as the internet sort of became what it is, to see people online? Do you get a lot of, like, fan feedback and response and, oh, I love the Angry Beavers and I love this specific episode and any sort of fan interactions in person, anything that sort of stands out? Yeah, I get letters uh, from fans who want drawings of uh, of the Beavers. (laughs) I will say this about the Angry Beavers audience. They're really loyal and we're not as big as spongebob sure <laughs> be nice but we're not but those people that are our fans they just beavers is it yeah and you, and you can feel it you yeah know, it's like they they'll stand by it there was a uh, last episode of the angry beavers yeah where the beavers themselves they broke the fourth wall norbert told daggett hey we're cartoons the show's over we're canceled it's done but it's okay we're going to come back in reruns and we're going to do this and that was that all off the cuff was that a script that was written was it what's the what's the backstory behind that well first of all mm-hmm. we were coming up on the end and uh i just thought it would be funny if if uh, norbert <laughs> knew they were cartoons so funny and daggett thought they were real beavers and uh, through the course of the cartoon, you start out in full color, and by the end of it, it's really just script pages that they're reading with doodles on it. That's but great. They, but they become stick figures and then and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, uh, some uh, lady executive who's no longer with Nickelodeon, mm-hmm. 
started this rumor that I was trying to kill the beavers. Oh. <laughs> I wasn't trying to kill the beavers. It was just a joke because sure. if they wanted to bring them back, they're back. They're back. So uh, the whole joke was that Dad like, you mean we're really cartoons and we're going to go into, yeah, yeah, we're going to go into uh, syndication and uh, yeah. the, the studio will make lots of money, but we won't make a penny. Norby, what happens when you're over? Oh, it's not so bad. No? If a cartoon's good, even if it isn't, it's rerun incarnated. Ooh, does that hurt? No. Only when you get the later checks. The cartoon being over guys rerun it over and over, and they make lots of well-deserved money. Which they share with the people who made the cartoon, right? <laughs> Boo! Boo! <laughs> Woo! Right. Okay. So you see, it's all for the better. Right. Even though we're vanishing, uh -huh. we'll be back over and over again at virtually no cost to the network. One of the things that um, holds up incredibly well is the opening title sequence. Mm -hmm. which you said before we started, you guys did in like three weeks. Is that true? That's true. Tell us a story about that. Well, we were so busy getting the show ready. So one night, three weeks before the uh, show comes out, I had done storyboards for the main title Okay, like six months earlier. Got it. But they just got put aside for whatever reason. And uh, so we're sitting there and Mary Hampton's sitting there and we're just, we may be eating pizza. I don't know. We were just sitting around talking. <laughs> she goes, okay, how about that main title? Well, you know, you know, where's your main title? And we just all looked at each other like, we don't have, and she, the funny thing is she's just burst out laughing. Yeah. Because we don't have a main title and we've got three weeks to go. <clears throat> so Michael Lessa, who was the line producer at the time, and uh, I'm currently working with, mm -hmm. a wonderful man, um, he got all these animators together and he got, he animated the horn sequence himself because he used to be an animator in Hanna-Barbera. Wow. So he opened, the, he animated that. I, I worked on the scenes where they're, wrestling around and stuff and uh, we had these great animators work on it so like they had to animate it over a weekend like a long weekend no way and then we had to clean it up in like in three days and then we had to go to ink and paint I mean it was just like burp, 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 burp. wow and then Charlie had to write the music so he wrote mm. it after so um, let me try to get this he straight. did the music so first he did the music first and then you guys but you had already did the, the boards you said six months to a title sequence yeah. did you sort of change that once the music was written well I well, I told Charlie I said I wanted to sound like uh, Tijuana Brass Tijuana Herb Brass Albert. yeah so yeah. Uh, he did that and I think he did two versions of it and uh, so Mary said let's I like this one mm -hmm. so we used that so we had the song but the boards that I'd done you know I presented to management and the management's like yeah okay cool well, we'll get to that. And yeah. they, they put him behind a dresser or something. And, sure. Uh, and all of a sudden, like, uh oh. Three here weeks we go. to go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Mitch, you worked on also a bunch of great superhero stuff mm. that I want to touch on because I'm also a huge fan of comic books as well as cartoons. I yes. love comics and love a lot of those classic Marvel characters. But you worked on Next Avengers Heroes of Tomorrow, which I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to be honest with you, totally honest. First time I heard about that project, didn't grab me. I went, no, those aren't those aren't my Avengers. No. Second time I watched the movie, third time I watched the movie, I was like, oh, this is fantastic. I love these characters and such a great take on, you know, sort of kid perspective of that world. Right. You worked on Hulk Versus, which was awesome. The Superhero Squad Show, which was fantastic. Hulk and the Agents of Smash. Hulk where monsters dwell. What was it like to be sort of neck deep in that superhero world? Well, the, the nice thing about Marvel is that once you're vetted, Mm -hmm. They're very critical of who comes to work for them. But once you get vetted, you 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 have a kind of a free reign of if you're producing a show. The trust. So sure. it's really nice. Yeah. It's, and, and they were good to me. I didn't know I was going to work there for almost 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but when I was working on the uh, the Lionsgate movies, yeah. Craig Kyle was still there, who's moved on to huge success. And uh, so I was standing outside, and he came out, and I was just chatting with him. I said, well, if you want to do a series or something, yeah. keep me in mind because I've done all this other stuff. I don't know, maybe two weeks later, he called me. Would you be interested in doing a series called Superhero Squad? Yeah. So I did a <laughs> test. It was fine. And then I uh, went over to Film Roman, the Film Roman and Stars, mm -hmm. and started working on that. And uh, But uh, the, the process of, of getting the show to the point where you produce it <clears throat> with Marvel, uh, they're very, very protective of mm -hmm. their characters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to be careful of how you design them and what they do. Sure. But the uh, they were really uh, open to the comedy, 
You know, yeah. once we get started on superhero squad, super funny show, super funny yeah. show. I mean, jokes at Galactus's expense, and that's you know, so yeah. that's a little sacrilegious to some comic yes. book fans, but. Let's make fun of Galactus a little bit, yeah. you know? <laughs> the one joke we couldn't get in the show, though, was they were in a walking through a sewer, and Thor, who was played by uh, Dave, wonderful guy, great ad libber, they're walking through the sewer, and Thor looks down and like, that's not a candy bar. <laughs> and they wouldn't let us put it in. Oh, man. And <laughs> that's I, I just I thought a poop joke Come would be on. great right here. Coming from Thor, that's hilarious. Yes. The last thing I want to ask you before we wrap up is uh, the show has a big part of its audience that are people looking to get into animation or students right now and yes. they would like to break into this industry and they have this lifelong passion if you could give these people any advice what would it be <clears throat> that's it's, this is going to sound old-fashioned but if you want to get involved in animation if you want to be an artist if you want to be an animator or write or whatever put down your phones <laughs> put down your phones and yeah. talk to people and watch people because it's going to come back to haunt you if you don't and uh, that was one of the things when I went to Cal Arts. Disney was very big on, you know, when you go out, we want you to go to the mall and sketch people. Yeah. Just all kinds of people and talk to people. Mm -hmm. Because you have to know those personalities. You have to collect all those personalities to make your characters live. And um, I went with Beavers. Obviously, Richard and, and Nick had a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. But also, I could pull from growing up and people I know yeah. and throw things in there. So I, it's very important to be observant of what the world around you. If you want to be in this business, you got you, you got to know people. You got to expand. Well, okay. thank you so much, Mitch. Thank this you. was fantastic. Thanks, Hector. There you have it, everybody. Our conversation with Mitch Shower makes perfect sense that the Angry Beavers was as funny, as sharp, as sarcastic, as witty as it was. Huge thanks to Mitch for making a great show and for coming in and sharing some of his stories. Guys, you're not going to want to miss an episode of the podcast, so please subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Visit us online at nickanimationpodcast.com for more episodes and tons of bonus content like cool behind-the-scenes The Angry Beavers stuff. Thanks to the awesome crew who puts this podcast together. This podcast is produced by Jonathan Highlander, Dana vasquez Everhart, Jamie Goss, Tony Gutierrez, and Andrew Hughes. Original music by Useful Creatures. This week's episode edited by Jonathan Highlander and Josh Caldwell. Our social media team is Narmay Vanassians, Sammy Armager, and David Watson. Manny Grujava is our engineer. Music